Greetings. I'm a baby boomer, and all through my life, Jews have been moving into, into South Florida. In my youth, I heard a story. I'm going to tell you my version of it. There's a train going from the northeast towards the south. There's a man on the train sitting across from him is an older man with, uh, sitting next to a suitcase. And the, and the older man keeps keeps kind of chanting, singing, Deedle, 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 I'm going to Miami. Deedle, 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 I'm going to Miami. Well, the, you know, after a while, it got to be annoying to, to the man across from him. And so uh, he, he finally said, uh, Old man, I, I, I wish you would uh, please stop that. It's getting annoying. Deedle, 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 I'm going to Miami. Deedle, 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 I'm going to Miami. All right, if you want to be stubborn like that, I'm warning you. If you keep that up, I'm going to take that suitcase and throw it out of the train. Deedle, 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 I'm going to Miami. Deedle, 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 I'm going to Miami. That's the last straw. So the man gets up, he opens the door of the, the window of the train, takes the suitcase, throws it out of the train then lowers the window, sits down, and then he hears the old man singing, Deedle, 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 the suitcase wasn't mine. Hope you like that story. Today I want to give you a, a what I call a prophetic pr perspective, a prophetic perspective. And the uh, reason I'm doing this is because I'm, no I'm noticing that out there in uh, <laughs> mainstream Christianity, there are people that are kind of pushing... Um, events, uh, perhaps getting people riled up uh, beyond what, what would be uh, appropriate in certain respects, kind of pushing, you know, the end time. Uh, and and uh, I want to make sure that people who listen to me are, 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 are st stable and well-grounded. If you look at Ephesians 4, that's one reason that there are ministers to keep people from, you know, just being swept away uh, by whatever the you know the latest craze may be, uh, and and are, are well grounded in in scripture, um, in uh, Revelation. Uh, by the way, I'll say this: uh, on May sixth of nineteen sixty eight, I walked into my first Bible study uh, as one who was you know becoming Christian. Uh, I walked into my first Bible study May sixth of nineteen sixty eight. I left the the yeshiva. Uh, around March 17th or so, if there, it was after Purim of 1968 that I that I left the yeshiva. Uh, but anyway, it May 6th of that year, after the Days of Unleavened Bread and so on, um, I went to my first Bible study on a Friday night. It was it, right where the action is, you know, uh, downtown Manhattan, where you had uh, the uh, Pennsylvania Station and the Madison Square Garden, and you had Macy's and so on. Um, I was in a hotel. The Bible study was in a hotel called the Penn Garden Hotel. As far as I know, it's not there anymore. But some of you who lived in, in the New York area may remember it. Well, when I walked in, the minister said what I expected him to say. He said, if we've only got three and a half years to go, we've got to get down to the grit. Three and a half years, many of us in that community of, of commandment-keeping Christians, many of us believed, uh, who were at that Friday night Bible study and all around the world in that community, we actually, we, we believed that within about three and a half years, in 1972, we thought, we would, we would possibly have to be taken to a place of protection, as Revelation 12 speaks of, and that perhaps by 1975, we would have the second coming of Christ. Later on, it was modified by seven years, so many of us, so many people were thinking it would happen in 1982. Well, I'll continue this story. I hadn't planned to go into it at length, but I'll continue this story. Finally, in 1978, the greatest scholar in our community uh, got up and said, "There's 40 years to go," and uh, so we, you know, we had to get ready for the long haul. Now he he is dead now, but the 40 years have come and gone as well. You know, from 1978. You know, the 40 years have come and gone. And uh, towards the end of his life, he, he began to acknowledge that, well, maybe, you know, th things weren't going to end uh, 
around that time, you know. So he, I guess you could say he finally, you know, backed away from that. But I, I want to, to tell you that no matter how long we have to go, so to speak, how long history continues, we only have our lifetime to, 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 to live uh, as disciples of Jesus Christ, to, to show him that we indeed want what he has for, in store for us, you know, to be kings and priests in his kingdom when he returns. We only have our one lifetime to do it. In Revelation 1, it's, it says, uh, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So John was given this revelation by Jesus Christ. And there were some things that did happen shortly after. But the book of Revelation extends all the way, you know, to the end of human history and beyond, you know, into the uh, realm of the New Jerusalem and so forth. So, yes, there were things that were occurring even in John's time and shortly after, but then it projects all the way, you know, to, uh, to the climax and beyond. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk a little bit about the kingdom of God and the coming of the kingdom of God and, and giving us a, a perspective. Because there, ha there have been encouraging signs along the way. One of the greatest developments in, in history, frankly, has been the, the uh, partial restoration of the, of the Jewish people to, to their, to their ancest ancestral homeland. Um, now I was, I had, I've lost relatives in the Holocaust. We just recently had the, uh, as I'm speaking today, we had recently the United Nations commemoration of, of the Holocaust. And in the Jews community, it is often, uh, it has been normally com uh, commemorated in the spring, uh, Yom HaShoah, as it's called in Hebrew. And there are Orthodox Jews who, who uh, keep, of course, the fast of the ninth of Av, and during that time, they would uh, have memories of, of, of what happened in World War II. But the, the point I'm bringing out is that after that disaster, just three years later, uh, we had the, the uh, State of Israel, the first independent Jewish state in, in uh, 18 centuries or so, and, um, uh, or more, you know, on and on. It depends how you count it and how you, how you figure it, but uh, just amazing that three years after that, you had the, the rise of the state of Israel. And since that time, we now have a, a significant percentage of all of the world's Jews that are back there. And yes, they're in a precarious position in some sense, but also it's becoming a world power, a very prosperous nation and very influential and becoming a, a, like a mini you know, world power in its own right, in spite of the fact that it is, it is under tr tremendous pressure. Pressure has not yet uh, gone. It remains remains under pressure, but yet in spite of that, it's just been it's been flourishing, and that is something very encouraging to students of prophecy. But let's understand that that is only a partial fulfillment of what God has said uh, is was was going to happen to Israel. It's a step in you know in the direction of the fulfillment of prophecy, but there's a lot more that has to happen. A lot more that has to happen. Uh, I want to go to uh, Ezekiel 34. There's a, a beautiful prophecy there. And it talks about the fact that, and it's got to be a millennial prophecy when you, when you think about it. When Jesus Christ returns and sets up his kingdom on earth, we're going to have a situation that we have not, has not been since the time of the Garden of Eden. You also can read about it in the second chapter of Hosea. Na and, of course, Isaiah 11 and so on. Nature will be at peace with us. Uh, we won't have natural disasters, as we call them, you know, Mother Nature, as we say. We won't, ha and not only that, even the animal kingdom will, will be functioning differently. We won't have predatory animals that, that, are, uh, that could be a danger to people. He, in verse 25 of Ezekiel 34, he says, I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause wild beasts to cease from the land and they will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I will make them uh, and the places around all, or around all around my hill a blessing and I will cause showers to come down in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. So the weather will work out ideally. Then the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase. They shall be safe in their land, and they shall know that I am the Eternal. 
when I have broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them, and they shall no longer be a prey for the nations. Nations are often pictured uh, in, in their own uh, culture by animals. They're pictured by a bear or, or, or a, a lion or an eagle. And in the Bible, uh, the nations are pictured as wild animals. For example, in Daniel 7. Well, the, uh, the prophecy in Isaiah about peace among animals is also uh, 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 implied a prophecy of peace among the, the nations of the world who have been generally predatory in their behavior. And here it says, along with peace in nature, peace with animals, peace with the climate, in verse 28, and they shall no longer be a prey for the nations, nor shall beasts of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and no one shall make them afraid. And uh, you, I, I can go on from there, uh, the, rest, the rest of the chapter. But this is beyond whatever progress has been made. You know, uh, we're, we are not in that, in that kind of a period. That is really a millennial prophecy. And if you, you go on to the 36th chapter of Ezekiel, and again, we can be inspired by the, by the fact that, as I said, there is now a state of Israel. Uh, uh, miraculously, they revived the Hebrew language, and, and it's now a common language there. And on and on we can go, all the archaeological discoveries there. But, you know, they are so, it's still so far from these millennial prophecies. You know, you could talk about many different aspects. If you think about it, if you know the condition of, of, of the people in Israel and the culture there, and the condition of, Jew, of Jewry worldwide, you, you would realize that what, it, what we have there is a partial uh, let's say a down payment on what's ultimately going to happen and besides that another thing we need to consider <coughs> is that there was the house of Judah and the house of Israel there was a northern kingdom that was taken into captivity never returned and we have lost tribes and yet the Bible speaks about these lost tribes as ultimately being reunited with their brother with their brethren to the south how, how is that going to happen and in what what form will it take now I have my views on what happened to the twelve uh, uh, to the lost tribes, which I've spoken about in the past and hope to speak about in the future, and there are different people have certain people, uh, well, many people have different perspectives on, on on what what that's all about, and as I said, I'll eventually I'll get back to what mine are, but in any case, we have not yet really seen that. I mean, you you could say that some of these groups from, uh, from some exotic locations have been coming back to Israel. But many of these people are lost Jews, not necessarily lost people from the northern kingdom. And in many case, and, and also in many cases, they may be uh, non-Jews who've converted to Judaism. Maybe there are some Jews in, there that mixed with them, but many, many of them may be, in effect, converted uh, as well, which isn't a problem. They're entitled to, go to, be, to be back in that land, but it doesn't represent a fulfillment of that prophecy. But I'll say more about that in a moment. I want to go to, to Ezekiel 36, and uh, I want to go to verse uh, 24. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. So this is, there's a conversion that's going to take place uh, of that nation, and then they will help convert other nations. They are, they are the, uh, frankly, the chosen people, Am Segula. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're the, they're, they were to be an example in ancient times. And uh, Jer Jeremiah 31 says that the new covenant will be made with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Now, and, and, and that began to happen on Pentecost. The first Christians were Jewish. But, but on the other hand, it expanded. And we have Paul talking about the wild olive tree grafted onto the onto the tree you know we have now the the uh, worldwide church the universal church and almost entirely uh you know non non-jewish and and that's the condition that will be you know until the second coming of christ and at that point then we have all the various tribes of israel regathered and we have israel as the first nation converted as a nation and then influencing the rest of the world you could look at isaiah 19 uh, for example, in other in other uh, scriptures, so in effect, the millennia begins with the conversion of the of the nation of Israel, 
And uh, let's go to verse 26. And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. You know, this is what what, uh, what uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus. Yes, you, you know, you're a descendant of Abraham, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, y- y- yes, you're, you're, you're part of the uh, people of the covenant, but you need to be born again, uh, you know, and, and uh, this all of us need to be born again, and that includes, you know, the, the, the nation of Israel. And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of, fl- of stone out of, out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and shall be my people and I will be your God. I, I want to go to verse 29. I will deliver you from all your uncleanness and I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. So yes, physical prosperity, but it goes along with a, a, a spiritual renewal. Uh, in effect, you, what you, you're reading about here is is the Brit Chadashah, you know, uh, uh, what is it, Ikini the Aviki. It's, it's the um, New Covenant. And... Uh, as I said, we, we can be inspired by what has happened, but a lot more history has to happen over there and with those people and with many others who are a part of that, uh, uh, of that ethnic group. Uh, or, as I said, those of other tribes who were in the Northern Kingdom uh, who, who really remain, in a sense, uh, what's the right word, Un- <laughs> for the most part, among most people in the world, unidentified. Are you with me? Now, one of the one of the important things that you would you would ask if you were a student of the Bible and reading this, you would say, "This is wonderful. Jesus Christ is going to return. He's going to uh, gather his people uh, uh, in their land. They're going to be converted, you know." And, and 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 but then you're thinking, "Well, what about people who've lived and died all these years, and they're not going to be around in the millennium? They've already lived and died. What happens to them?" And what happens to them is that if you read the book of Revelation, they are resurrected to judgment after the millennium. There is the great white throne judgment period for those who uh, have not really been forced, you know, to, 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 to make their to make that decision, has not have not been forced to live their lives, an entire life, uh, showing that indeed they they are seeking first the kingdom of God. That's most of humankind. They will be resurrected to judgment uh, after the millennium. And this is what Ezekiel 37 is talking about. Now, I realize that in, in a certain sense, it could be referring to what happened after the Holocaust. It can be applied that way, but that's not the primary meaning. But it can be applied that way. I remember in 1978, I was in, I was in Los Angeles listening to a speech by Menachem Begin, at that time Prime Minister of Israel, and before he spoke, Gregory Peck came up. Gregory Peck was not Jewish, but he was a friend of the Jews. He was in a famous movie about anti-Semitism called Gentleman's Agreement. And Gregory Peck, the actor, got up and read from Ezekiel 37. And that's how he was understanding it. But there, but let, let's give, give the primary meaning if you just read it objectively. So let's go to Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Eternal came upon me and brought me out, of, uh, out in the spirit of the Eternal and set me down in the midst of the valley, and, and it was full of bones. This is the famous Valley of the Dry Bones. You, you may have heard the, fa- you know, the famous song about the dry bones. Then he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, Oh, oh Lord Eternal, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O oh, dry bones, Hear the word of the Eternal. Thus says the, the Lord Eternal to these bones. Surely I will cause breath <coughs> pardon me, to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you, uh, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Eternal. That's very much of a theme of Ezekiel, the book. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is quite 
a vision that Ezekiel has here. Uh, let's go to verse 8. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also he said to me in the ninth verse, Prophesy to the breath, in a veil haruach. Prophesy to the breath, Pro uh, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord Eternal, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, Our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. You know, this is like the blood of, of Abel that cries out in Genesis 4. You know, uh, or the saints that uh, cry out in Revelation uh, 6. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord Eternal, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Eternal when I, o when I have opened your graves, o, o my people, and brought you up from your graves. So this is speaking about uh, those who, as I said, they lived and died never really having uh, a clear uh, understanding of, of uh, well, let's say, what the options are, which is really most people in, in human history. I will put my spirit in you, he says, right? This is conversion. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Well, in, thi in this case, uh, the spirit is, in, is is enlivening them, but it uh, seems to imply that as part of that, they will also have the opportunity to be included under the new covenant. Then you shall know that I am the I the eternal have spoken it and performed it, says the eternal. So whatever you know meaning you can put on this in a, in, a, in in certain ways, like the midrash, if you want to apply it here or there. But if you read it, you'll see that it ties in with other verses that you can find in Isaiah and uh, in Daniel and, of course, in the New Testament and certain questions that Job asks. Uh, in, in, so altogether, we see that, and other verses that perhaps in Samuel and in Deuteronomy that, in, that discuss the resurrection. That is a basic doctrine of, of Judaism, a basic doctrine of Christianity. It's a basic biblical doctrine. Uh, the, the, uh, Anastasia or Anastasis, right, or in, in Hebrew, Tchiat Hametim, enlivening the dead, the resurrection. Uh, and so, again, these are prophecies that are millennially, even post-millennial. And now we go to Ezekiel 37. Again, the word of the Eternal came to me, saying, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and ride on it for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. There was a southern kingdom dominated by Judah, but including other tribes, such as my tribe of Levi. Then take another stick and ride on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. Joseph was the birthright tribe, and Ephraim was given a, a status, although he was not the firstborn, he was given that status. And Ephraim became dominant in the northern kingdom and became an, a name in the Bible, which I believe you, you'll see often is, is symbolic of the entire uh, northern kingdom. Then join them to one another for yourself into one stick, and then and 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 they will become one in your hand. Oh, so he's prophesying a reunion of these two nations. They were ethnically the same, but they were split. Now it happened in America that there was a north and a south, uh, you know. But the Confederate states didn't last that long, you know. They were forced back in. But in this case, Israel was separated from Judah, and then. Uh, disappeared is, is, is from history, but they're coming back according to this prophecy and others. And when the children of your people speak to you saying, will you, will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, you know, there was, this was a sign that people could see. Say to them, and remember that the prophets did some unusual things. They didn't have TV, radio, movies, internet, you know, uh, so they did unusual things to make a point. Say to them, Thus says the, eternal, the, uh, the Lord Eternal, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions. 
and I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they, they, they shall be one in my hand. And, and of course, you, the people who were seeing this, they knew what it was about. It, it, it personally affected them. You know, these, these were their, their brethren who, who were lost. Uh, maybe at that point they might have known generally where they were, but, but uh, over, over history, who, you know, people now are, are debate where they are. And the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. So this was a sign to those exiles that someday there would be a restoration of the nation and even a reunion of all the 12 tribes. Then say to them, Thus says the Lord Eternal, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side, and bring them into their own land, and I will make them one nation in the land, and the mountains of Israel in, on the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. They shall not defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. So, it's, you know, it's a very different world from today. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places, <coughs> excuse me, in which they, they have sinned, and will cleanse them. Then they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And then he goes on and, and speaks of a resurrected King David. Now, Jesus Christ told the apostles that they would be ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel, but there will be one king over the whole nation, and that's David, the ancestor of Jesus Christ, who had a lot to do with the Bible as we know it. You know, a lot of the Old Testament is directly or indirectly uh, con uh, uh, connected to David. God made a covenant with David that only from David's family would come the Mashiach, the Christos, the, the anointed one, the Messiah. He must be Davidic. That's very strongly pointed out in the New Testament, of course. But David, my servant, shall be their king over them, and they shall all have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. This may imply beyond David as shepherd, the one shepherd, uh, uh, Jesus Christ, because he, of course, will be even over David. He'll be over the whole world, king of kings and lord of lords. Then, shall, uh, then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt, and, and they shall dwell there, they, their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. And of course, over him will be the king, you know, Jesus Christ, who, who is both Davidic and divine. You know, he's the uh, Logos, the... Uh, the word in flesh and you know incarnate and who is now resurrected to immortal life but you know he he's he's uh, you know in other words he's god become man and that man was resurrected to immortal life uh but uh there is also the divinity of jesus christ uh the logos is eternal the logos always was and always will be and, and so uh, jesus christ is both davidic and divine that's, of course, a very controversial doctrine. It, it is essential to Christianity. Uh, the, the fact that God became <laughs> you know, literally one of us, uh, that, that is something that is, that is not in Islam, not in Judaism. Uh, you know, it is, it is in, in Christianity. But it is essential knowledge, very important to understand. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. You know, this, this, of course, is talked about in Jeremiah 31 and elsewhere. You know, there's going to be the new covenant, which I've been, I've been speaking about today. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them. I will establish them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. So that may... Uh, in effect reflect back uh, to, to the millennial period. I don't know if people will continue to have <clears throat> children during that white throne period, but uh, uh, <clears throat> it, it, they will be multiplied in the sense that as, as the uh, people of God, uh, as the church of God, uh, more and more of them will, be, will become a part of God's family in that sense. In that sense, 
you know, his family will, will be multiplied. My tabernacle also shall be with them. So he's going to be present. He'll be present with, with them. And this, of course, when we keep the festival of tabernacles, we remember that God wants to tabernacle with human beings. And we remember the ministry of Jesus Christ where God tabernacled with human beings. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God and they shall be my people. The nations also will know that I am the eternal, that I the eternal sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. So um, there will be a temple in Jerusalem. There will be a functioning priesthood. We won't have personal sacrifices required of us. Jesus Christ is our sacrifice. But there will be uh, national, what uh, a teacher of mine called court rituals. There will be sacrifices being offered at the temple by the priesthood, and they will be a, a way of reminding us uh, of, the, of, of what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. There will be a ped pedagogical tool to remind us of the importance of Jesus Christ in God's plan. And we can read about that temple later on in the book of Ezekiel. So these are prophecies that are millennial generally in nature. They, so in some cases they may reflect back to the, um, well let's put it another way. These, these that I've just read, uh, um, no I'm sorry, I want to go back because this prophecy that I just read is a millennial prophecy. It talks about the reunion of the tribes and th this, is obvious, this is obviously before you get to the white throne period. Uh, beginning with verse uh, 15, we're getting back now to the millennium and God, God will, will, re, will unite the Israelite tribes in the millennium so they will, indeed will multiply. Uh, there, people will have children evidently in the millennium and uh, so they will physically multiply at that time but they will do so as a united nation and David ruling over them. And, of course, over, under David will be the Twelve Apostles. And, of course, under the Twelve Apostles will be various kings and priests, you know, who, who will be the resurrected saints. The kingdom of God, is, when it comes, Jesus Christ will return. The saints will be resurrected. Jesus Christ will rule over the world. Uh, David will rule over Israel. The Twelve Apostles will rule over each over a tribe. Uh, they'll be reunited. They will live as physical people, as, as other people will live around the world and they will be the first converted nation, then other nations will be converted uh, uh, over time. Uh, and over, more and more people of the world will become part of God's church. Uh, it will come to the point of spiritual unity in the world, as it says in Zechariah 14. You know, in that day, you know, uh, the eternal shall be one in his name one. The, you know, the only, there'll be, everyone will be focused on the true God and, and, and his way of life. So uh, that, clar that should clarify it. You know, so we're talking here, these are millennial prophecies. We did have an interlude, as I said, with the Valley of the Dry Bones, because that that's necessary so you, you wouldn't think, well, what about the ones you know, that have missed out? They've lived and died, and they never really... They lived in a world with the demonic influence. They lived in a world with satanic influence. You know, they never really uh, had the opportunity to be to, to, for salvation because in this day and time, God is choosing those whom he uh, w will save. We are, those of us who are a part of God's church, are first fruits. He is not saving the world now. He is calling out certain ones to be kings and priests in his kingdom, uh, and they will rule over uh, humankind, Israel and the other nations, uh, and then after the millennium, there will be a resurrection of, uh, as I said, of most of, of the human race who have not yet ha had the opportunity to make that decision. They will live perhaps 100 years. We, uh, I, we don't know for sure, but it, perhaps they'll live uh, 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 at least long enough to show their commitment to uh, want to be a part of God's family, and then they too will, will uh, be resurrected then to, to immortal life to be a part of God's family uh, eternally. Now, the reason I, I mention this, and I hope I've been clear and I haven't confused anyone, but the reason I mention this is because when you get to Ezekiel 38, you know, you've just had, 
millennial prophecies, even a post-millennial prophecy, then you have a, a millennial prophecy at the end of Ezekiel 37. When you get to Ezekiel 38, this is post-millennial. This is, or during the millennium, I should say, it's not post, but this, this is happening during the millennium. We already have the tribes reunited. We have the tribes back in their land. We have the conversion of, of, of Israel. And then, if you just follow the flow of the book, now we have uh, a, an invasion of, of an Israel far different from the modern state of Israel today. The modern state of Israel today has a wall protecting it from terrorists on the east, <clears throat> has a wall protecting it from uh, illegal immigration on the south. Uh, it is armed to the teeth. It has um, Iron Dome. It has an Iron Dome anti-missile defense. You know, it, it, is, it is a military powerhouse in that part of the world. And frankly, you know, most people who are knowledgeable believe it has nuclear weapons. This is not the Israel that's, that's uh, discussed in, in Ezekiel 38. Uh, this is an Israel that seems to be not undefended. Uh, because why? Because it's being defended by spirit beings. We've had the second coming of Christ and a great victory in the land of Israel, but evidently in the northeast of, of Israel, in areas such as Russia and China, in areas you know, to the northeast, there will be this idea that ev evidently that this invading force can be dealt with in spite of the fact that they've had this great victory uh, in, in, in the Middle East. The fact that now Israel is undefended militarily uh, somehow will, will cause these nations to, to, to believe foolishly that they would be able to uh, overcome this force that has invaded. Perhaps they will think it was some kind of extra, extraterrestrial force, and they they will feel somehow that they will be able that they would be able to uh, to overcome. Because as I said, there won't be anything physical uh, that, that that will scare them necessarily. They they won't see a fortified country. They won't see an armed country. They won't see a country with a with a, a an army, and so they will think, well, this would be our opportunity to to uh, plunder. Uh, let's notice the, the you could call this ten nations, depending on how you uh, understand Roche. Uh, it could be Roche could be the the head prince, but it could be the prince of Roche, and in that case you could have, a, a, as you find in the Bible that pattern of ten. You have in effect ten nations in Daniel, ten nations in Revelation, ten nations in Psalm eighty three, and you could have ten nations here. But. Um, Let's uh, take a look at um, what it says uh, uh, in, in Ezekiel 38 and verse 11. You will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them, dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. As I said, that doesn't describe uh, the, the modern state of Israel, but it does describe the, the 12 tribes gathered together in their ancestral homeland in the millennium. And as I said, you, it would seem extremely foolish after this great victory that Jesus Christ wins on, upon his return, why these nations would think they would have, have a, a chance to, uh, to, to uh, go to war now. Uh, but as I said, it, it may be that once the, this, this uh, victory is won, uh, they will not yet be uh, maybe apparent or visible to, to the, these nations in the Northeast. Um, that, that, that may be what, what, the, what, what the problem will be. Uh, and it would seem that there will still be a residual negative nature uh, in humankind. Uh, even though Jesus Christ has returned and the saints are ruling, but evidently the conquest of the world by by the uh, divine forces the conquest of the world evidently will be in stages <coughs> so excuse me so that evidently he's not going to take over the entire world all at once and there'll be an, there'll be an area left uh, so that there'll be this one last 
battle uh, and, and then indeed that will be it for for the rest of the millennium there's no indication of anything major after that although it does talk about rebuking peoples and ruling with a rod of iron so there may be occasional problems here and there you know sporadic here and there at least in the early years of the millennium but I, it would seem that over time the whole world will be at peace in fact for, for example if you go to Isaiah 11, that's definitely promised. Um, Isaiah 11 and verse 9. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the eternal as the waters cover the sea. So, as I said, that is ultimately what's going to happen, but evidently there is an initial period before uh, God rules over the entire world, and these nations to the north and east of, of the Holy Land. Uh, we'll, we'll try one last time, uh, you, you could say, to attack and to, and to plunder, thinking that they are t dealing with a defenseless nation. So these events occur after the second coming of Christ, I, would, I believe. And I think if you read the book of Ezekiel, you can draw that conclusion. If you read Ezekiel 38 and 39 in the context of uh, of the of how the book is how the information is flowing, and then of course afterwards in Ezekiel forty through forty eight, then you come to definitely millennial prophecies, prophecies about the the temple in Jerusalem, prophecies about the territory that that each tribe will occupy in Ezekiel forty eight, so it certainly ties right in. So the context of Ezekiel thirty eight and thirty nine it is a millennial context. And so the reason I want to bring that out is so that people will not get, um, what's the right word I would think of, will not kind of put the cart before the horse. And as we read the, the news, uh, 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 as we read about Middle Eastern events, uh, we, some people will, will have you to believe that these events of Ezekiel 38 and 39 are about to be fulfilled. I would strongly disagree with that. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the Middle East in, in, uh, in the next number of years. I know what's ultimately the Bible prophesies to happen, but what, what happens over the next number of years between now and, and the climax uh, at, at, uh, of human history, I, 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 I don't know, but I'm just saying that there could be all kinds of events, ups and downs, you know, and all the re and all the rest of it, uh, but it, but the fulfillment of Ezekiel thirty eight and thirty nine, I I would have to say I I do not believe is imminent, and so I, I I would ask people to be cautious about how to handle this material, you know, to to be to be careful and think of it as very likely, you know, into the frankly in the far future, so I, th this perhaps can can um, be of benefit to you, uh, just in terms of planning your life. Uh, as I said, when I was young, I thought that by the 1980s, you know, the millennium would be here. And then uh, I, I thought, okay, uh, by around, you know, 2017 or so, uh, the millennium would be here. Well, as I'm speaking, I don't know when you're going to hear this talk, but I'm speaking in 2022, and the, and the millennium is not here. And a lot of history has to happen before uh, the, uh, the millennium occurs. A lot of prophecies need to be fulfilled, uh, and, and, and they're in the Bible. They can be read and, and, and I believe understood. There might be differences about how to interpret them, but in any case, there's enough of them there to, to show that there indeed is a lot of history yet ahead. You know, And so we have to live our lives, make our plans, um, do what we need to do to be responsible uh, stewards of whatever uh, physical assets we have, whatever responsibilities we have in our family and in, in our employment and all the rest of us, and, and think in terms of, you might say, the long haul. Uh, I want to go to uh, the sixth chapter of the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew 6 and verse 33. And as I said, I hope I've been clear in how I've explained things, and and uh, that I that, that you know 
you'll be, let's say, you'll be more, you'll understand better uh, uh, the, the passages that I've read and be, and be more clear as to what they're talking about as a result of the talk. I certainly, you know, want to uh, help under, uh, enlighten people, not confuse them, you know. And uh, I want to go to uh, Matthew, the sixth chapter, Matthew 6. And I want to go to the 33rd verse. I had a, a teacher who uh, used to keep his alarm clock set for 633. So when he woke up in the morning, he would see 633, and this verse would come to mind. We're told, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be uh, added to you. So our goal is to seek first the kingdom of God, and we should be praying in this same chapter. I go to the 10th verse, uh, and, and we're to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we should be looking forward to God's kingdom, praying for God's kingdom, and living as people who want to be a part of God's kingdom. But we have our lifetime to, to live the kind of life that, uh, in effect, will demonstrate to Jesus Christ our commitment to follow him. To, that our commitment to Jesus Christ is our personal Savior, our Lord and Master, our High Priest and coming King. You know, we don't know when He's coming. We hope it is soon. But we have only one lifetime to prepare to participate in His coming Kingdom. So let's, in, in, in a, an appropriate fashion, seek first the Kingdom of God. All the best to you and yours.